Stephen Emerson has spent more than 30 years of his life studying, researching, and working on national and political and security issues for the U.S. government and as an academic. He cut his teeth as a Southern African regional specialist for the U.S. Department of Defense in the early 80s, where he provided political and military analysis to senior American policymakers in Washington. Dr. Emerson is the author of numerous classified and unclassified publications on African politics, terrorism, counterinsurgency, transnational security challenges, and the future of American security and foreign policy engagement in Africa. He has held numerous government and academic positions, including Security Studies Chair at National Defense University's Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, and more recently headed the Africa Regional Studies Program at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Among his, his degrees is a doctorate in international relations, comparative politics from the University of Florida. He's married to a U.S. Foreign Service officer and, and has accompanied her on multiple tours of duty with the Department of State in Africa and Latin America. They currently reside in Orlando, Florida, where Emerson continues to write, consult, and lecture on African political and security issues. So it was my good fortune to meet Dr. Emerson at a conference a year or two ago, and he happily consented to come to the Academy, and we're very fortunate to have him here. He is uh, our leading authority uh, on the, uh, the uh, Civil War in Mozambique in the 70s and 80s. So let's give him a warm welcome. Okay. Thank you. It's great to be here at the U.S. Military Academy. Are you paying attention? Okay. U.S. Naval Academy, yes. Okay. My father was a naval aviator, and my oldest brother was too. Um, I could not fly, so I decided I would become a civilian academic. So there is opportunities out there for those of you who don't want to be aviators. Um, in the bio, it's interesting because that was written um, partially for an overseas audience. Uh, some of you know from this morning that U.S. government service includes a, a tour about 10 years with the CIA, or as a political military analyst on Southern Africa. Um, and I did cover the Mozambican War during that time. And that was actually one of the reasons why I wrote the book. And you always wonder about why do people write books. And it's a good question to ask, you know, why is the author writing this book? And the reason I wrote the book is because I thought there was a lot of garbage out there, believe it or not, that everything on Wikipedia was not true. And I wanted sort of to set the record straight and also to produce a, um, a type of book that I thought was a more comprehensive look at the war. There's books that are good on certain aspects of the war, but nothing that's, that's really comprehensive. So with that in mind, uh, let's begin. Okay. Um, the agenda, what we're going to look at. Uh, first, we'll do some little historical context and, and setting stage. Um, you know, didn't it? Maybe if we just did these, yeah. Is that better? Okay. Um, We'll talk about a little about the nature of the conflict. I mean, it's often characterized as a civil war, but that's a little simplistic, and I'll show you why. We'll go through a couple benchmarks, and then I'll talk about modern day legacy, which is actually very important because we are almost a little over a week away from a new round of elections in Mozambique. October 15th, we'll start a round of elections for president and the legislature. Um, which is really good news in the country coming out of this conflict, but uh, it's also probably the last hurrah for the, the rebel leader of, um, of the anti-government forces as well. Okay, okay. Mozambique um, sits in Southeast Africa, located, always have to have a locator map. You guys are probably smarter than the average bear, can maybe locate um, more African countries than most. But here it is here, um, of course, Madagascar, which my niece knows where that is now, right? <laughs> um, but formerly part of Portuguese East Africa, South Africa, here to the south, uh, Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia, the east, Zambia, and Tanzania in the north. This isn't labeled, but this is uh, Malawi, okay? Not to be confused with Mali, of course, right? Okay. It's composed of 10 provinces, and I throw these out here. We'll throw a lot of names and acronyms at you, but just to give you a feel for something. Um, three in the south, um, the river here, the Sav River, generally divides this. It's also geographically and ethnically very different. These people are more related to those in southern Africa. There's a lot of historical connections there. The center four, uh, Manika, Safala, Tet, and Zambezia. Um, this group, more ethnically to Rhodesia, but also farther north as well. And then the three in the north, okay? 
Okay, a little context. Okay, 1975, April 30th, okay, the fall of Saigon. And that's generally what people in the U.S. were focused on, obviously. Um, U.S. You know, involvement in Vietnam was, was coming to a, a final climactic ending, okay. And I know even myself I was looking. My father had three tours in Vietnam, which was a lot back then. Um, you know, this was a time I was in high school. Um, but we were focused on what was going on and what was going to be the future of Southeast Asia, okay. But it, about a year earlier, in April 1974, was another very momentous event, was a coup in Portugal, okay. Portugal is a colonial power of Mozambique, and it was involved in three colonial wars, not only in Mozambique, in Angola, and in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde, okay. It was the poorest country in Europe at this time, okay, in the 70s. So it really strained the resources to the limit. Um, it had a very uh, right-wing government, it's usually classified as a fascist government, believe it or not. Um, but it was overthrown by some actually uh, very socialist radical army officers, but there was just a lot of frustration with fighting the colonial wars in Mozambique and they wanted them to be over and the country was practically bankrupt. Okay. So what you had is Portugal after having control, control's a little strong, but a presence in, in Africa and particularly these colonies, particularly Mozambique, for almost 450 years now was coming to a sudden and abrupt end, okay? Um, the world was changing. Mozambique was gonna become independent, so was Angola. No one knew what was going on, so it was a very chaotic time, okay? Um, little collage. In South Africa, you had the Nationalist Party, the ruling party that was supporting, that supported apartheid created apartheid in 1948. <laughs> um, P.W. Bota, really strong leader, former defense minister. Um, Rhodesia was in the midst of a civil war, okay, known as the Bush War since 65, but it had an intensified since 72. Um, you had rioting in South Africa, the Soweto student riots. Um, the ANC was becoming more, uh, as escalated its guerrilla campaigns in South Africa, okay. And you have the rise of, of Mugabe's group is growing stronger and his guerrilla army okay, was pushing, fighting the Rhodesians here. So you have all these regional um, conflicts going on around Mozambique at that time. Okay, so 1975, June, Mozambique becomes independent. Portugal's withdraw, turn the reins over to the ruling party, which is for Limo. They, they become the ruling party. They were the guerrilla organization. They are a Marxist type organization, one party state supported by the Soviet Union. Here again, you get this east-west dichotomy that we talked about this morning a little bit. This is sort of uh, in the Soviet sphere. They become increasingly entangled with the Rhodesian War, and I'll explain that a little more. Um, they joined the frontline states, which was a group of countries that were supporting the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, including Zambia, Tanzania, Angola, okay, Botswana, those countries. And then it became an official member, but also in some cases a de facto member because it wasn't allowed to join some of the economic unions of the communist bloc. And it started to receive military and economic assistance from the Soviet Union. So on the military side, what I want to point out here is after the fall of the Portuguese and Mozambican independence, the Rhodesians who were fighting the threat across the northern part of the country, infiltration mainly coming in from Zambia, some cutting across here, this part of Mozambique and infiltrating, now had over a thousand mile border opened up. Okay, for Zimbabwean guerrillas. This ZANLA stands for the Zimbabwe African National Liberation Army, which was the military wing of Mugabe's political party. Okay, Robert Mugabe guy who's still president today. Okay, so they created these bases and staging areas in Mozambique with Frelimo permission, and Frelimo actually would commingle their forces sometimes, and now they could infiltrate. So you can see the problem if you're fighting a counterinsurgency and you're a Rhodesian, right? You've just been strategically outflanked, right? You have a major problem, okay? 
Remember Rhodesia, very small country, relative uh, white minority rule at its top, maybe 250,000 white population in a population of about five or six million. Okay, military force at this time, 76, probably about 30,000. Okay, so pretty small, um, of which probably 80% was black. Um, so you have a small military fighting counterinsurgency. You know, the traditional counterinsurgency, you want 10 to 1. Okay, they were nowhere near that. Okay, so they have a major problem here. Okay, so keep that in mind. So that's sort of setting the stage. That's where we are when we start to talk about the Mozambican Civil War. Now, let's talk about the nature of the conflict. Okay, is it a civil war? Well, there were Mozambican versus Mozambique, so Mozambicans, so you could say, yeah, that's the definition of a civil war, certainly, and that is an aspect of it. Was it an internal power struggle? There was this opposition to Ferlimo. Remember I said they were trying to create a one-party state and have a single party control all aspects of the political, economic, and social structure of life on that Marxist model, okay? Had a lot of problems. People objected to that. There, wasn't, there weren't elections um, prior to them taking power in June 75, so you could say that's an aspect. Okay. Was it a target of apartheid destabilization? Okay. South Africa said if you're going to become a member of the frontline state and support the ANC and having these people infiltrate and launch guerrilla attacks in our country, guess what? We're going to make you pay. We're going to destabilize you. Is that an aspect of it? Okay. Was it a Cold War venue? Was it just simply something that played out between the East and the West, the Soviet Union and the United States, that this was just another place where East and West could clash? Or was it also something where even both superpowers actively supported the combatants in sort of a proxy type war? Okay. So I think you know where I'm going with this. Okay. Um, but the end result was 16 years of war. Okay, the war really starts, we ate it in 1977. Um, 800 to a million people dead, no one really knows how many. Two million plus displaced. Um, infrastructure, the country totally destroyed. Okay, so on one level, it certainly is a civil war. You have, whether it's Mozambican versus Mozambican, whether it's internal power structure, uh, internal struggle within the power structure or for Limo dissidents and you'll see the insurgency grew a lot out of people who defected from the ruling party and went over to the insurgents. Okay, so there's certainly that aspect of it. Also you have this regional conflict. How much it also was certainly influenced by South African and the, and the apartheid, anti-apartheid struggle as well as the Rhodesian conflict. So that is an aspect of it. And then it certainly has this Cold War overlay. Okay. So the bottom line, of course, is that it's really all three of these levels of analysis. And to understand the war, you have to consider all three. And in some accounts, you'll see one point emphasized more than the other. And there's a couple books. There's an excellent book on South African destabilization called Apartheid's Contras by a guy, William Mentor. But it focuses only on this aspect. Okay. So to really understand the war, you have to look at all three levels of analysis. Okay, let's look at some key benchmarks. Okay, the first one and kind of critical is the insurgency, and these guys become known as RENAMO, R-E-N-A-M-O, which is an acronym, Portuguese acronym for Mozambique National Resistance. Okay, they were an a created insurgency. This guy who I interviewed, much older now, this picture was taken in about 1977. Uh, Danny Hartman was a Rhodesian intelligence officer. Okay. Him and a team of five guys um, working out of this farmhouse on the eastern border at Odesi, that border with Mozambique, created, recruited these guys, started to build this insurgency. Okay. There was a radio station they had, uh, Voice of Free Africa. Okay which at one time was the whole element of the organization, started purely as a propaganda thing. There were no fighters. It had a radio station. Okay, which is interesting. They provided logistics and training and then later on communication support. 
So we'll talk about this later on as well when we talk about the modern day legacy. So Renamo grew as a created organization by an external um, party as a counterweight to what they saw their deteriorating strategic position. Okay. okay, this is a picture from about 1978. The guy on the far left standing up there, the Renamo fighters, is a guy named Andrew Montengesi, Andre Montengesi. Um, he's the original founder. He came in with, um, it was a Mozambican. There were only 30 troops originally what they had. Okay. Notice all black faces. Ferlimo during the war tried to portray Renamo as an ex-colonial territorial army as well and a lot of former Portuguese soldiers you know, make the argument this is an anti-colonial or a neo-colonial struggle. These people want to reimpose colonialism, but it wasn't. Now the Rhodesians did try some of that, but it just didn't work out because these people could had more sympathy with the local population, their grievances and stuff. The majority of the core of original for, or Renamo fighters were in fact ex Frelimo soldiers, which is important to remember. Okay. Rhodesian support. It was very critical, especially once they started establishing bases inside, Rod inside Mozambique. And one of the bases they did is a place called Gorongosa. It's this mountain in that middle of the part of the country, I told you in Safala province that we looked at that map. It's high in this mountain. This mountain rises 6,500 feet from the African plateau. Okay, a lot of times it's surrounded in clouds. But they established a base up there. They'd fly in the most modern aircraft they had, a DC-3, okay, known as a Dakota locally, and do these airdrops. This is a, a map by a former pilot made up for me of the drop zone. And I'll show you what it looked like. That's what it looked like. And that's not smoke, those are clouds. They said a lot of times it would be totally obscured by clouds. You could not see the mountain. So you're coming in on a prop plane <laughs> trying to drop in this valley. They would light fires if you could see them. Okay, kind of scary. Okay, so the war starts to intensify in Mozambique as of course the Rhodesians start up Renamo. They say, we want you to act as the eyes and ears of the Rhodesian forces. Show us where Mugabe's guerrillas are. Tell us how Frelimo's supporting them and we'll launch surgical strikes against them, which they did, started cross-border operations, okay? That put Mozambique and Frelimo on its heels a little bit and obviously strengthened the um, insurgency. But as events would take place in Rhodesia, here we go, that regional dynamic, there starts to become a political settlement to the Rhodesian Civil War, the Bush War, okay? In December 1979, there's an agreement, signed a peace agreement known as the Lancaster House Agreement that calls for an ending of the war, elections for March of 1980, and then independence for a new Zimbabwe in, 19, in April 1980, okay? So, what does that mean? That means Renamo is now gonna lose its big rear base at Odesi in, in eastern uh, Rhodesia. For Limo goes heavy on the offense. Now they figure they got these guys on the rope, they're gonna lose their benefactors. In October of 79, that person I told you, Andre Montengesi, he died. He was killed in combat. He's replaced by the younger guy I showed you there, who is the current presidential candidate and rebel leader, Alfonso Giacama. Okay, but he had a problem exerting some of his control. So there was leadership struggle going on. And then of course you had declining strength and demoralization going on as well. Okay. So, 1980, April, Zimbabwe independence, Renamo's in a boatload of trouble, okay? Ah, but, enter South Africa. We'll move the operation, and they did lock, stock, and barrel. Brought in some C-130s, lifted out the radio station, the training staff, about 250 recruits, few vehicles, took it all down to South Africa over on the border. We'll show you where that picture is, okay? Took over the entire operation. They started providing massive logistic and training support and much more than the Rhodesians ever could. And South Africa's the largest military in, in at that time, most still are today, okay? 
They also created a political wing. Remember we talked about it as a created insurgency? It was a military organization. They said, hey, you're an insurgency. You need a secretary general. You need ambassadors abroad. We need people in foreign countries. So they started to create this political wing, which we'll see later created a lot of problems because that was grafted on into the military structure. Okay. Troop strength started to rise. These guys were getting money. They were getting paid. South Africa was even grabbing Mozambicans inside South Africa, throwing them in the army, in the guerrilla army. Said, congratulations, you just joined up. Okay. And then they were able to help Renamo reestablish guerrilla bases closer to the South African border, in this case, inside Mozambique again. Okay. So here again, you've got this regional dynamic. The Zimbabwean negative for Renamo becomes offset by the South African positive. Okay. Now the war rages on. It's 1980, 1983 up to 1984. With this South African support, the guerrilla forces Renamo are really hammering for Lemo pretty badly. Okay. So much so that by March 1984, this guy, Samora Michel, president of Mozambique, is forced to sign a non-aggression treaty with South Africa that says, you can read some of the text, that you guys stop supporting South Africa, or South Africa stop supporting Renamo, and we will stop supporting the ANC. That's basically what all this says. Okay, down here. That's the gist of it. And so Michelle says, I don't want to sign this, but I'm going to lose this war. We're getting our lines of communications crippled. We're losing a lot of troops. We're being pushed back into the cities. Okay. If South African assistance goes away, just as, Zimb as Rhodesian did when Zimbabwe came into being, I know we can regroup and we can go on the offensive again and we can take care of this guerrilla insurgency. So this is in March 1984. So this is a key benchmark. Okay. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Okay. The war, in fact, gets a little worse. And I'll tell you why in a little minute. But so much so to the point that now Zimbabwe is forced to intervene. Their lines of communications, particularly from the Port of Baira here, going down to what is now Mutari, there's a rail line here, there's an oil pipeline, there's a road. It keeps getting attacked. So they send troops in to intervene to protect this corridor. They also send in troops to protect this line the road that goes up to Malawi and Tet as well. Okay. But because for Limo's in so much problem, they're able to convince, Michelle is able to convince Mugabe to go on the offensive. So now Zimbabwe joins into the fray. Okay. And their first the major operation is this capture of Casa Banana um, as the Renamo headquarters. Okay. Not up on the mountain anymore. It's, it's about 30 miles to the um, east of it, uh, this newspaper picture. Um, but Samora Michelle is presenting a gift to this Zimbabwe brigadier who actually had nothing to do with the campaign, but he was a senior officer, so he gets an award. Um, this is the paratroop colonel. He's, he was a white former Rhodesian who stayed in with the Zimbabweans. I interviewed him, Lieutenant Colonel Dyke. He led this parachute assault on the Renamo headquarters which disrupted, they didn't kill a lot of people and they didn't capture the rebel leader, but they were able to capture a lot of supply and disrupt it. But most importantly, they found these documents called the Gorongosa documents, which were the series of diaries and papers that showed South Africa was still supporting Renamo. So amazing, they lied, right? Just like in risk, when you make that deal with that guy not to attack you, right? And then the next turn, here they come, right? So they found out about that. Okay. Okay. Eventually, however, South Africa, because of internal changes within South Africa, would reduce its support. Some pressure from the United States, but just a changing nature of the dynamics internally within South Africa, that that support from South Africa would steadily decline and then eventually end. Okay. However, from 1987 to 1990, there's this just back and forth slugfest going on between the two sides. And I remember you know, watching it as an analyst. A lot of times, 
Both sides were out of bullets, so it was it was hand to hand. It was machetes. Okay, it was pretty vicious. Anything you could think of to go after your enemy, they did. Okay. More devastation of the infrastructure, road ambushes, large number of atrocities. Okay, which is still debated to today about who committed them. My belief, and I address in the book, little diplomatically, I'll admit, but I think Renamo was responsible for the majority of them. Okay, they just didn't have as good control over their troops at times. Um, but this is where you also create situations of, in, uh, of famine. Mozambique is one of those countries that also goes through drought. You can't deliver uh, relief supplies. So most of those deaths I talked about, the 800 to a million, a lot of those are just you know, civilians, okay, caught up in you know, the nature of war. By 1990, though, both sides are pretty well beat up. Okay. Um, it's like two fighters you know, in that 25th round. Or the Washington Nationals versus the San Francisco Giants, should I say? Yeah. Right? Yeah, sad. It's 2012 all over again. Um, anyways, there's some local initiatives that start going on. Mozambican religious leaders, particularly the Catholic community, had long been involved in trying to bring about some peace talks. Uh, especially the Archbishop of Baira there, a guy named Jamie Gonzalez, was heavily involved. Philemon Renama also had some stuff behind the scenes talking to people outside of the countries and various third countries talking. But more importantly, by 1990 and 91, when I talked to some former soldiers, they were talking about, I was striking an agreement. You know, you guys stay in your garrison, we're staying out, we're starving, we're just trying to find food. You know, same thing you guys, let's just not fight. So that was not good news for the generals, obviously. They didn't want to hear that. On the regional level, we talked about the Zimbabwe intervention. Mugabe also starts to get personally involved. And one of the big demands of the Renamo forces, Jukama, is that Zimbabwe withdraw their combat troops. And he said he was willing to do that, depending if on Renamo stop attacks and try to enter peace talks. So that was part. You also have the Kenyans and Malawians get involved in facilitating negotiations. Malawi also facilitated a negotiation between Mugabe Ment and Malawi face to face with Jakama during the war. So you start to have those things on that regional level. So that's that regional dynamic that we mentioned before taking place. On the international side, you have this Catholic community, San Dengesio, which is just a Catholic lay community. But one of their former members was Archbishop Gonzalez. They're outside of Rome, so they offer to be a mediator and try to help broker some talks. Italy gets involved. It's a large investor in Mozambique, had project. Portugal had still some economic interest there. They're involved. The United States then comes involved, and I was a little in on some of these early discussions. Remember, it's 1990 now, the end of the Cold War. We don't have the Soviets around anymore. So what role can the United States play to help broker a peace? Okay, and then the United Nations gets involved in putting a peacekeeping force eventually in there. So what you have is these three coming together, and then eventually, you know, are they able to have a peace agreement? Yes, almost exactly 22 years ago. Okay. In Rome, they reach them. Alfonso Giacomo, the new president, Michelle. So some more Michelle died in a plane crash in 1987, but this is a uh, Chisano. They reach a peace agreement. Okay known as the peace, Rome Peace Accords, or actually the General Peace Agreement in 1992. So it called for direct elections of the president, parliamentary elections. It established, at first time, the right of political parties, all sort of the basic democracy rules that we see, the structure for democratic elections, things like that. It also called for an integration of the armed forces, so many Renamo guerrillas could be integrated into the military. There would be a new military. We call the um, Mozambique National, Mozambique uh, Defense Forces, okay, which would have representation at the senior level from Renamo. The current deputy chief of staff of that is a former guerrilla commander, uh, General Cambon Menem, an impressive guy, who was actually one of the first Renamo group in, in the, that 30. So he survived the war from 19... 77 through 92, pretty impressive. 
Um, so all that structure was in there to set the way for new elections. In October, two years later, of 1994, they do hold elections. Um, Chisano wins the presidency. He loses like 56, 44, so it's fairly close. Uh, they get a majority in parliament, but Renamo has a strong presence. And ever since that, they've gone through about five, I think this will be the sixth round of elections where they've actually had constitutional change. For Limo has won all the elections. They've changed presidents. They've had new people. Um, there has been an increase now. It's not just a two-party. There's a third party, the Mozambique uh, Democracy Movement now that's out there. So there's actually three major parties, including and a few other little ones as well that are out there. But it's a success story in the sense that you do have now a democratic structure. They do do elections. The country has been rebuilt a lot. It's one of the fastest growing economies in the world, believe it or not. Of course, you started out at practically zero, so that's done. But they, they've done very well. Um, modern day legacy. Let's talk about that. The first one, and this haunts, and this is why Jacama, if he wins the election in like a week, you guys can write me a letter and tell me <laughs> how wrong I was. But why he won't win is because this point I talked about before. Renamo was always a military organization. They never developed politically. They didn't know how really to involve the local community, people, recruit, build a basis of grassroots support. Okay. As a military organization, they imposed their will on the people, and of course, and in Africa, or most places in the world, when guys with guns walk into your village, you know, yes, you agree to anything they're going to say. Okay. So they never evolved as they probably should have. So if they had started out as a political organization, then became a military organization, he might have a better chance today, in my opinion. Also is because of his military authority, um, he's an authoritarian type leader, um, he hasn't let people rise up in the ranks and question him. When I interviewed him a couple years ago, um, you could tell he was still very much the guy in charge. And it's much cases with strongmen, same thing's true in Zimbabwe with Mugabe. They don't let people, potential um, successors or contenders rise up around them. Okay. So the only problem there is when that person dies, in the case of Mugabe, there's gonna be a bit of anarchy until you figure out who's in charge. In this case, you haven't had any younger leadership develop. So Renamo is seen sort of as the old guard. And more than half the population in, in uh, Mozambique now wasn't even born when the war ended, okay? So, um, on Frelimo part, Frelimo's leaders, and I'll, with a little asterisk, I'll mention that later, um, still perceive that political concessions are a sign of weakness. So they've always tried not to deal and negotiate. I mean, they had to at the end of the war, to end the war, because they were in danger of losing, or so they thought. But generally, they, they thought that if you give concession, it's just a sign of weakness, and your opponent will take advantage of that. The current person running for president, a guy, uh, Felipe Nuese, is actually a northerner, which is a big change from those three provinces in the north we talked about, which is different. In the past, they've all been from the south. And so he might be more willing to do that. He represents actually a more underrepresented element within Frelimo. So that could be kind of a good sign. And then finally, and I think this is important, the economic center of the country has shifted north of the Zambezi, that river up into that area, Zambezi province in the north. Um, a lot of talking oil, natural gas off the coast there, that northern part of Mozambique. Um, there's mineral deposits there. They've always been there, but now they're able to access some more coal and rare minerals and stuff like that in Tet province in that area. So where in the past the center was in the south, down by Baputu, which is close to South Africa, a lot of rail line traffic and revenues from port fees and stuff like that that kept the economy going, even tourism, South Africans going to Mozambique. Um, now this dynamic is shifting north. So the fact that Frelimo is now putting forth a northerner, I think, is a very wise move on their part. So he can represent maybe some of those people more who feel outcast and they may not be able to uh, feel that Renamo is their salvation. They feel that maybe Frelimo is reforming. Okay. So that's where we stand today. Like I said, the big 
news will be the election, so I'll get your CNN, right, or your Twitter feeds ready to, you know, watch the Mozambican elections. I wanted to leave some time for questions. And I know I covered a lot of ground, but I'm willing to talk about Mozambique or Africa in general if you want to as well. Question from the midshipman. Make sure you guys are paying attention. Sure. Sir, um, midshipman, third class rules. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Cuban intervention in Africa. Okay. Yeah. In um, Mozambique, it was not a factor. Okay. And when I was a CIA analyst, all I had to say to someone to scare the pants off, did you see the Cuban intercept talking to the Mozambicans? You know, they would light up, you know. Here again, it was that Cold War dynamic. Anything potential talking about Cubans coming to Mozambique, people freaked out. They did intervene and were a major combat force in Angola, about 20,000 of them, even more at one time, okay. The big issue, and this sounds somewhat mercenary, because actually it is by definition, Angola had a way to pay for troops and had a way to pay for extra Soviet weaponry, okay, because they had oil, they had diamonds and things. Mozambique didn't, okay. The resources it had were still undiscovered or you couldn't get to them because of the war. In Angola, the, the area, the oil producing area was segregated and really out of the war zone, okay? So they had no way to pay for them. Late in the war, one of the problems why Frelimo got weaker is the Soviets stopped giving them equipment too. And not that they were really good again, you know, they gave them like T-34 tanks, you know, and advanced strike aircraft, well advanced for that time, MiG-21s, which aren't really efficient in fighting the counterinsurgency, right? Heavy artillery, things like that, so the issue. So the Cubans did not be, were not a factor in Mozambique. The biggest area they were was obviously Angola, and it became a negotiating point. We talked about it a little this morning in the class about get rid of the Cubans and then the South Africans, the U.S. will be able to convince South Africans to grant Namibia um, independence. So, did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, sir, what were some of the social and economic effects of the violence in the war on Sure, and it's true. The war is very much a um, a legacy for, for for the older generation. Like I said, because of Mozambique is such a young country, and this is true of all Africa, about half the African population is under the age of 15. Okay, because it's it's just growing. It's younger, um, so they don't remember the war. But their parents certainly do, and there were some problems like the past year when Jakama, who actually had to chase him all the way up here to Nampula to find him, he went back and relocated and did this publicity stunt of saying, I'm going back to war if the government doesn't uh, meet some of its demands from the peace settlement. He claimed they hadn't honored them. And there's some debate whether they did or they didn't 100%. But these, and these got a few guys that started ambushing road traffic and that, and that really panicked the older um, generation who were worried about the violence and, and the war that went on. But um, this is certainly a society that had that trauma of war, and there's a lot written on it. Carol Nordstrom wrote an interesting book on the psychic of war. Um, in fact, some of the early disarmament programs that they used to do was to collect weapons, particularly old AK, and make art out of them you know, like um, plowshares to art. There's one of an AK-47. If you go online, you'll find it. A chair made out of AK-47s, you know, that they do. They would melt them and do stuff like that. But there's definitely that, that psychic for the old generation that they're scared that war could come back. And in the last year, there were fears that that would reignite a little bit. I never considered it a possibility because he is bigger than me here, uh, Chikama. And there's no way he was going back to live a life in the bush and, and run around. And his uh, quote unquote former combatants, they weren't even born at the time, so he had no experienced troops there. Now, could they create a little havoc and a little problem? Yeah. But, uh, so this is certainly one of the case studies if you're looking about the, in, the violence on society and that stuff. And I didn't mention it, but it's in my book. Um, because the war got so nasty towards the end, there's this third force that rises in this area of Zambezi called Namprama. And it was a movement by this guy who was an African traditional healer who claimed he died and rose from the dead. And he was impervious to bullets. 
and he could anoint his followers so they wouldn't because they were getting beat up by both Frelimo and Renamo sons. So he tried to carve out this whole little empire and they actually put a lot of the Renamo troops to flight. These guys would run from them. They were armed with nothing but sometimes drums, sometimes sticks, a few spears and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so it's sort of that, that magic element which you do have in, in Africa a lot. But the people were so fed up they wanted to believe this guy. Now eventually Jakama personally got his best troops together and they went after him and they killed him. Um, so that sort of put the end of that movement. But you do see these things where people are under so much threat. They look for any area of hope to end the violence and that's what they saw this movement as. <coughs> Okay, um, a good question, and sometimes, and I would argue this as, as working the problem from the CIA side, and we talked about it here a little bit uh, just recently at um, before class, that the policy debate went pretty much based on bureaucratic structures. There's a saying in politics about where you set is where you stand. Okay, so where you set in the organization is where you're going to stand on something. DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, okay, was much more pro, let's support Renamo, just like we're doing with Unita in Frelimo, or just like we're doing Unita in Angola. Okay, let's support them because they're anti-Marxist, there's anti-communist, we can make the Soviets pay as part of the Reagan doctrine, we can bleed them, that's good stuff. So let's support the insurgents. Okay, State Department said no, 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 we need to wean Michelle and eventually President Chisano away from the Soviets with better economic aid, relations with the West, and pull him that way. And we at the CIA were sort of in between, but my argument was because this was a created insurgency, of which we didn't really have a good handle on, but we were always looking for areas of popular support, and we didn't see a lot of them. So my thing was, say, sometimes the best thing is to not get involved. And it's hard for Americans, believe me, I just tell my African friends, say, we always want to do something. We want to fix it. We want to make it right. And sometimes it's the worst thing you can do. You have to step back. So in this case in Mozambique, we didn't until after the Cold War, at the time of the peace process, we came in and there was a Colonel, Colonel Henningsen, I remember, was former attache, defense attache in Harare, really great guy. He was the guy who held Renamo's hands initially during the negotiations in Rome talks. We're here. Renamo, it's okay for you to talk to Ferlimo. They were just so out of their league about how to negotiate a peace because they were used to fighting. They had no you know, political um, acumen. Some of these guys were probably maybe 10 years over, older than you. And now you're asking that person to negotiate you know, an end to a war. So we came in at the very end, but in a diplomatic fashion with support from, um, it, like I mentioned, the Italians, the Portuguese, and the Catholic community there to help bring about the peace agreement. Our mainly thing was at the end, money to help facilitate the elections. There was a stipend paid to Renamo, so you guys can go out and campaign. So, and a lot of it was psychological. So, okay. um, sir, you said that you didn't think that the Kwama would and Renamo would go back to resolve, uh, resolve right. the violence. Right. Um, as Renamo becomes less and less relevant politically in the country, what do you think that they would do in that? Say, have some people say. Yeah, well, back. what the problem, let me see this slide here. <coughs> here he is now. This is Chicago. Well, that's a few years ago. He has even a bigger guy nowadays. But um, yeah, this group started rising out of Renamo, the, the Mozambican Democratic Movement. Okay, from some defectors within Renamo because they couldn't see themselves gaining any important positions. And this is centered in that city of Baira, in the center part of the country. So if you ask me, this group has a chance to rise up at the cost of them. Now, I don't think you'll get too many infection, defections from Palimo. You might, joining this. But I think um, Nuesi is a really strong candidate for Palimo. So I think because he's sort of killed the party off himself. He didn't let it grow and evolve because he wanted to be the top man all the time. So I think it will, you know, eventually fade away, fracture, and, and maybe distance will link up here. You may see it reform some other ways. 
let's thank Dr. Emerson for his time. Thank you very much. Okay. So never believe that you're impervious to bullets, <laughs> no matter what the uh, doctor tells you. And sometimes doing nothing is doing something.